Hello, good afternoon and welcome to Midday Live on TV3 with me, Martin Nesiedu Date. We are live from our studio here at Adesawe in Accra. Coming up within the next one hour. Angry residents of Pokwasi and Maira in the Accra block, in, in Accra, block key access routes as they protest deplorable state of roads. The Acting Inspector General of Police meets families of the three missing Takradi girls. As to what the reason is, we'll be telling you shortly. And on the international front, flight check suspended at Hong Kong International Airport for a second consecutive day because of anti-government protests. And uh, you definitely do know that the political season is gradually creeping up on us. And here at Media General, we tout ourselves as your election command center. And today, we are bringing you Constituency Watch and um, uh, the election command center. And with 11 days to the parliamentary elections of the NDC, we continue our build-up to the August 24 polls. Today, we focus on the Ayawasu West Wagon constituency, where actor John Dumelo is counting on what he says is his appeal among women and the youth to defeat his contender, Ifua Adubu. Adubia. Uh, here's a report by Kwachia Fredyama. Welcome to the Ayawasu West Wagon constituency. This is Constituency Watch, and my name is Kwache Afreniama. Now, this particular constituency has been in the news for all the bad reasons in the last couple of months. The last by elections held here that, in fact, brought in the incumbent member of parliament, Lydia Seriama Larsan, was shrouded in controversy. National security operatives were accused, and in fact, seen in video footages manhandling, abusing and physically assaulting some constituents in this area. This is the La Baoleshi Basic One School, which is in fact one of the polling stations in this area. This is a stronghold of the MPP and the last time the NDC won elections here was in 19. 96. The NDC has vowed to reclaim the seat going into the 2020 general election. But that would not be an easy feat to achieve, at least if one does a trend analysis of the election results here since the 2000 general elections. In the 2000 parliamentary elections, for example, the MPP's candidate George Isaac Amu secured 17,555 votes representing 56.20%, while the NDC's Elvis Efriankra got 11,388 votes representing 36.50%. In the 2004 elections, Akosia Fremopare of the MPP defeated the NDC candidate Samoa Diapena after she secured 52.10%. Mr. Diapena got 37.90% in that contest. Fast forward to December 2016, the MPP again won convincingly, securing 57.32% of the votes, with the NDC gaining 39.63%. The death of MP Chirmantine Jaco would present the NDC another opportunity to test its popularity here. However, the outcome of that January 31 by-election may not provide an accurate picture of any possible inroads the NDC may have made since the 2016 polls. Incumbent MP Lydia Sarah Malassan secured 68.80% against the NDC candidate Delan Likwesi Brimpong, who had 30.52%. But this was after the opposition party boycotted the elections following the violence which erupted early on in the process. Going into this primaries, two aspirants, actor John Dumelo and Efu Adobo, have been cleared to contest. John Dumelo believes should he secure the bed of delegates, he's in a better position to attract votes of women and youth in the constituency. Anybody who wants to win an election should concentrate on the youth and women. That's a, that's a fact. Any politician, every politician knows that. That if you concentrate on the youth and women, you are about 70% gone. So you are the man who can pull the, the votes of the women? Definitely. 
Why? <laughs> because you're a fine boy. No, are you are you telling me? I'm asking. Oh, I beg. I'm just a normal looking guy. I think I think it's about my personality. It has nothing to do with personal appearance. The actor has been embroiled in many controversies in the past. For example, in 2013, investigative journalist Anas Aremeyao Anas threatened to expose him for allegedly taking advantage of an unnamed woman and a three-year-old baby. He says that allegation was completely false. Sometimes it's best not to comment on certain issues. The more you comment, the more you expose yourself. Or Did not, that happen? No, expose yourself. Um, I don't think it happened. I mean, it never happened. And that's why I say sometimes I just don't want to comment on certain issues. Despite his immense confidence in winning the primaries, he is cautiously optimistic due to the unpredictable nature of delegates. Yeah, that's what I wonder if you fear delegates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. You, everybody fears delegates. All parliamentary aspirants fear delegates. Everybody across both NDC, MPP, PNC, CPP, everybody fears delegates. When I caught up with John Dumelo's only opponent, Efu Adobo, she was quick to rubbish the suggestion that the actors appeal among the youth and women who make him a better candidate. You agree with me that in 2016, John Dumelo was part of the celebrities for Mahama. That's the parallel structure of the party that supported President Mahama's campaign. Unfortunately, that was when we lost miserably in the elections. And so for me, it's not just about appeal, but it's about the strategies you put in place to win an election. Questioning his contribution to the party over the years, Efu Adobo challenges John Dumelo to provide evidence of his track record in the NDC. He doesn't have that record. He should prove it. He should prove his branch members, where he, he served the party at the branch level, where he served the party at the constituency level, where he served as a co-opted member of a region, he should prove that. There is a lot of descent. When I was doing NDC in 1992, when we started, I think he was in primary school. Bismarck Abobiaite is the NDC constituency chairman in the Ayawaso West Wagon constituency. He explains that the party's major expectation now is for the presidency to make public the report of the Emil Schott Commission that probed the violence during the by-election. We want to know what are the causes and the remedies that we are going to put in place as a political party or as a government to ensure that we don't experience such uh, challenge going into the 2020 election. So it's good. It will help us across the country for us to factor in so many strategies to ensure that, especially on the side of the security agencies, that if such a thing happens again, how are we going to handle it? In all the 275 constituencies, the National Democratic Congress will be filled in parliamentary candidates. The Ayawasu West Wagon constituency is one area it has to deploy its best campaigning strategies if it indeed wants to reclaim the seat from the MPP. But that will also depend on who it elects as parliamentary candidate going into that election. Will it be John Dumelo or Efu Adobo? Only time will tell. For TV3 News Constituency Watch, Kwache Afreniama, Ayawasu West Wagon Constituency, Accra. So do stay with TV3. We are your election command center. We'll be giving you extensive coverage of that election, which is due on August 24, and by extension, every election in the country. This is your trusted source. All right, let's go to some other stories now. Danger looms at Afariwa in the Ashaiman municipality as a private developer has blocked two streams which collect water from several communities into the Chemu Lagoon. Director of the National Disaster Management Organization um, in Ashaiman, Daniel Aqua, uh, confirmed the situation, if not handled now, can lead to a major disaster. Joseph Armstrong has more. For residents of the Ashema municipality, severe flooding after rains resulting in death and displacement is common. The situation is likely to get worse following the activities of a private developer who is trying to reclaim land by filling two streams. Residents who would not speak on camera for fear of being victimized says houses along the streams are submerged anytime it rains and fear the worst. So we know the kind of person, that's why it's like everybody is trying to, because there are strong guys behind him. Not that I'm, 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 I'm afraid to speak. I can't speak. Why are you afraid? 
he yes, won't but, talk. but the kind of people who are behind him. Regardless of the pressure that comes with the running water from adjoining communities such as Michelle Camp, Sebrepo, Bethlehem, Gulf City and Christian Village, this is an alternative provided by the private developer. I don't know who, whether it is a, an individual or a group of people who are trying to reclaim the land by filling uh, a storm drain. And the moment you fill a storm drain, it may have uh, adverse effect on other people. It may find its way and actually affect innocent people. He expects engineers of the assembly to act quickly. Looking at the storm drain and where the water normally flows from, I don't think. There's no way that particular channel can absorb the water. And that is where it will also find its way and affect other innocent people. Something has to be done about it. So I'll get authorities or other departments informed. The Shema Municipal Assembly is yet to respond to the issue. Joseph Armstrong, TV3 News. Now let's go to the western region because um, we are told that the Inspector General of Police, the Acting Inspector General of Police, is headed there to meet with the families of the three uh, fam of the families of the three missing Takradi girls. Uh, family of the kidnap one, Ruth Lovequeson, have expressed the confidence that the new Inspector General of Police, James Opombuene, will work to get to the bottom of the kidnapping case in Sekende Takrade of the Western region. And our correspondent has been following uh, developments in the region and will be joining us soon. But what we do know is that the IGP is expected to be in Takrade to meet with the families. And that will be a, uh, at least the fifth or the sixth government official or state institution uh, official to go to meet with the families just to psych them uh, ahead of the pathology tests that will be done and then all the forensics uh, as well. Our correspondent, Eric J has joined us on the phone lines. Eric, good afternoon and thank you for joining us. Good afternoon, Martin. Um, we are told the IGP is expected in, in, in uh, Takrade. Has he arrived? Yes, I can confirm that the IGP together with a team of policemen from the National Head Office and also some policemen here in the western region are in the region and they are meeting of the kidnapped girls. Um, I can confirm that the IGP and the team have visited the family of Rutla Quisin. They've also visited the family of Bintu. And I can also confirm that they are currently on their way to the house of um, Mr. Alexander Crunchy, father to the third kidnapped victim who is Priscilla Mantida Crunchy. So I can confirm that indeed the IGP is in the region. Right, and he has already met two families, we are told. Um, what, do you have a, an idea what the conversation was about? Okay, essentially, uh, the IGP said that he is around to, as it were, solidarize with them and also assure them that the police is doing everything humanly possible to get to the bottom of the case. He also really treated how important it is for them to, if you will, submit themselves to a DNA test following the discovery of some four human remains at two separate hideouts of the prime suspect Samuel Wolf. Right. And um, from what you've been able to pick up regarding the conversations, we are told also that very soon um, the, a team of experts or doctors will be in the region to talk to the families and maybe take the samples, the DNA samples that will be needed for the tests. Uh, how soon are they also expected in Takrade? Well, as to when the team will arrive in the region, that didn't come up. But snippets of information that we take is that it's pointing to the fact that maybe, yes, maybe the team will be in the region tomorrow to take samples from the family members. Mm. And finally, on the IGP, uh, has issues of security, general sense of security, come up in the discussions? You know, people living in Takradi following the findings of four human remains. Has the concern been put before the IGP that people are not too sure of the security of, 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 of Takradi? Has it come up? Yes, it has. It has. You know, over the weekend, there was this robbery case at. Uh, Anaji, a suburb in the region, and 
Um, some of the residents that we spoke to did mention that they are not too happy with states of security in their region. But what we do know is that the RESEC, that is the Regional Security Council, are planning an emergency meeting to look at new strategies of reassuring the residents that the security, they are going to deal with issues that are coming up with regards to the state of affairs here in the region. All right, thank you very much, Eric. We will definitely be coming back to you uh, after that third meeting with the fam one of the families, uh, the remaining family of the three missing Takrada girls. So if you're just joining us, the news is that the Inspector General of Police, the acting, uh, has arrived in Takrada and meeting with the families of the three missing Takrada girls. Subsequent bulletins will give you an update on that development. Stay with us. We'll be back with more. But time now for MTN Video Report. This is the state of prepaid meters in Ghana. The meters are lined up on a pool in numerous numbers. This is very dangerous whereby whenever one meter catches fire, it automatically will catch the whole meters on the pool. This is an example of a meter that caught fire. If it has not been the help of some residents around, this was going to be a disaster in one of the communities. We played in on government to do something about this. My name is Mensah Lord Abdul Bashir, reporting from Accra. This is still Midday Live on TV3. Stay, stay with us. We'll be back shortly with the latest in the world of business and uh, sports. All right, let's do some other stories now. And the Ghana Great Company Limited has assured the general public that the relocation of the 470 megawatt car power badge to second D will not have any adverse impact on power supply in uh, electricity consumption in the country. According to Gridco, there is adequate generating capacity to meet power demand uh, during the period that the badge will be temporarily disconnected from the national grid. This comes on the back of planned relocation of car power ship to the western region. The relocation is in line with uh, government's strategic policy for the car power ship to uh, utilize natural gas from the western enclave. The power ship is expected to be connected to some 330 kilovolts transmission lines in second D. And so that was the story that we got from uh, government over the weekend. Car power ship is saying that um, they, it has become necessary to move the ship to Takrade. And many have applauded the move. But then is that going to affect power supply or how uh, much we consume as uh, you know, those who depend on electricity? Government through Gridco statement is saying that we are not going to be affected. And we did the math and this is what it shows. So the current installed capacity for us is... 4,420, 4, that's the installed capacity we have as a country, or you know, those that depend on VRA and then the IPPs. If you look at, and that is installed, but then there is demand capacity, and that is 3,877, 3, I beg your pardon, 3,877, that is the demand capacity, how much we actually really consume or use. And if you subtract the total amount. So 450 is what car power is actually providing. But then car power's installed capacity is 470. So we are just taking the one that we actually do use. So if you take 450 from the car power, uh, what it is adding to the grid, we are going to be left with 3,427. Now that is what will be remaining if we look at, um, if we compare it to the installed capacity. If you subtract it from the installed capacity, which is the figure at the bottom here, you're going to have 543 as the excess capacity that is left for us to depend on. So it means that within that 17-day period where the the 17-day period where the car power ship will be moving from Accra to uh, from Tema to uh, Secondi Takradi, clearly we are not going to be having any challenges or any difficulty with power supply. But I'm not an expert. I'm just doing the math for you. Let's go to the phone lines and speak to um, 
Kojo Poku, who is an uh, energy um, consultant and analyst. Uh, Mr. Poku, good afternoon and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, good afternoon and good afternoon to your viewers. Right, to start with, government has given the assurance that we are not going to be affected by power, um, power cuts because the ship is moving. There are those who are already saying that there seem to be at least the possibility that we may be paying less. This is the premise of the question. If we are going to be using gas, that would mean that there's a possibility we would have to pay less. Is that a position you share? And is it true that uh, consumers are now likely to pay less because we are now going to be using gas? Well, yes. Um, but this calculation of the savings has already been factored into um, the tariff that was announced um, some months ago, which only accumulated to the 11.17 increase. So with the ship being moved, the savings is not yet to come. We are already enjoying the savings as per the calculation of the tariffs that was done. Right. In terms of um, reliability, if you look at our peak, uh, our peak now is between 2,500 and 2,700. And what you are losing out is 450, as you rightly said. Um, Send Power has also come online, and Send Power is about 350 megawatt plant. So if you add Send Power and you're able to provide fuel for Senate, Send Power is 350, Senate is 220. So if you add the, what Senate will bring on board and what um, Send Power brings on board, you are well over three, um, 550 or five, let's say 570. So right. it now adds more to the grid than what you are taking out. So I don't think we should have any worries of lights going off. Okay. This is hedge on the fact that the government would able to basically provide the fuel for the companies to work. We've been mm -hmm. told that the reverse flow is operational, so it means that gas from the Takrade enclave can now be moved to the Tema enclave for the companies like Asogli and Sempower to use them. So I'm hoping we shouldn't have any light off. Right. And um, how about you know, savings. We are told that the, the nation is likely to make some savings and then also we are going to be reducing losses because of this move. Um, how does this play in this uh, discussion? Well, remember with the uh, Sankofa gas, which is what the ANI produces, we have a take or pay. And uh, basically what happens is that since we have not relocated the car power ship or in built any infrastructure that uses the gas ENI is producing, whether ENI produces the gas and we use it or we don't, we still have to pay for the investment. So what's happening now is that we're paying something like $25 million a month. So when car power moves and stops using HFO and now moves on to use gas, we will now be making use of the gas from the Sankofa field. Mm. Secondly, yeah. um, you will now have the fact that the gas is cheaper than the HFO, which we've been using for the car power ship. So sunk of gas, uh, gas coming in will, will reduce the $25 million that we are paying for nothing. And the gas that is being used is cheaper than the HFO that we would have otherwise used for um, the car power ship. So those savings, like I said, is not yet to come. All that has been factored into um, the announcement that was made two months ago, which accumulated to 11.17% um, increase. And between now and when can, should we expect the savings um, to, to reflect or for us to start seeing that? No, we've already. I mean, like I said earlier, when PLC was doing the calculation to make sure, you know, one of the things that happened for the announcement not to happen in February, and it was delayed into July, if you remember, the government went to PLC and said, look, um, we are taking... Um, some exercises, and those exercises will help Ghanaians not to pay as much. And one of the exercises was that if the car power ship moves and it uses gas, not HFO, those savings, that has already been factored into the increase because the increase would have otherwise been much higher, around 20%. But those, uh, the use of gas instead of HFO, car power ship being basically moved to make sure that the, the gas take or pay is negated, all that factored into what we had for 11.175. So that savings we are already enjoying. Okay. Mr. Poku, thank you so much for making time to speak with us. Uh, Kojo Poku is joining us from the United States of America, uh, helping us understand. He's an, an energy um, analyst and was telling us how, as a country, we are even going to be benefiting from this decision by uh, government to move, or by car partnership, to move from um, a 
from Tema, that is, to the uh, secondary enclave. And uh, we are also being told that there's a possibility that um, that will not affect us, and it's a 17-day period. So within that time, you are rest assured that there are not going to be any power cuts. Okay. So we shift our attention to some other stories now. Angry residents of Pukwasi and Mayera in Accra are protesting the deplorable nature of the roads in the area. Residents say successive governments have failed to deliver on its promise of fixing the Pukwasi uh, Afiyama Bensu Mayera Road despite numerous assurances. They have been in, in, uh, interacting with my colleague Messi Darling Loco. The demonstration, which lasted for over five hours, saw residents blocking the major roads in this area with stones, tables and the burning of car tires. The Pokwasi police, who were at the scene to ensure the demonstration was peaceful, had to call for reinforcements from the police training school at Tesano. The municipal chief executive for Amasoman, Clement Wilkinson, who was at the scene to speak to residents, was heckled and prevented from making any comments. Residents say they have had enough of the talks. Assemblyman for the Mayera area, Kabna Apia, said several attempts to get the roads fixed have proven futile. I have followed the issues of this road for quite a long time. Um, but when it gets to the point when the people become disappointed as to various promises that has been made as to the construction of the road, sometimes, even though you wouldn't wish for such an event to happen, but you didn't have any option when they go on rampage. The residents gave government two weeks to start construction of the roads in the area. They are very unhappy about the state of their roads here and they want it to be fixed as soon as possible. From the Myra area in the trouble, Amasama constituency, Mercy Dali Local, TV3 News. All right, this is still Midday Live on TV3. Stay with us. We'll be back with the latest in the world of business. In business this afternoon, head of risk of the Bank of Ghana, Evelyn Kwetia, has urged corporate Ghana to, re to place emphasis on risk management to inform decision-making based on data. At the opening of the Africa Convention in Quantitative Methods and Risk Management in Accra, she noted that one of the major issues that led to the collapse of some financial institutions in the country was lack of risk management. Risk management in business is the forecasting and evaluation of financial risk together with the identification of procedures to avoid or minimize their impact. This concept is transferable and cuts across all sectors of the economy. At the opening of the Africa Risk Convention in Quantitative Methods and Risk Management in Accra, Head of Risk at the Bank of Ghana, Evelyn Kotia, noted risk management is the way forward in saving corporate Ghana. Some of the issues that affected the financial sector that we saw some banks being um, collapsed or being taken over was as a result of weak um, risk management in the respective banks. So every part of uh, the Ghanaian economy has to take risk management very, very serious because the moment you are able to identify your risks, you are able to mitigate your risks, you will uh, derive better benefit. The risk management convention and training is to offer politicians, policy makers, industry players among others to appreciate risk associated with their work. This could be used for you know organizations around the world uh, doing things like value at risk, probability of default and so forth, all the way to multinational organizations. And 20 to 25 percent of the course has to do with theory, but at the same time 75 percent of the time is hands-on application. Managing Director of OSL Risk Management, Dr. Elvis Hernandez Pedumo, urged the trainees to be the game changers after their course. After this event, it's important that these guys come back to the organizations and start applying these type of things into the day-to-day -day activities. And at the same time, helping decision-makers to make informed decisions. 
the Pro Vice Chancellor of UPSA, Professor Charles Bano, and Dr. Rexford Atabuache of the Coventry University, UK, put the Africa Risk Convention into the Ghanaian perspective. In the various sectors in the economy to improve on their decision making. Um, currently, you agree with me that um, some decisions have been made in this country. Uh, perhaps we may not have considered the right quantitative data for making those decisions. It quantify. Uh, it gives you a different perspective of how to manage risk. There were a lot of guys competitively wanted to take it to other countries. I was able to put economic and business case for this project to come to Ghana. Then it came to which institutions that we, we can partner with in Ghana. So we managed to talk to uh, investor professional studies. Now, a 50-acre cocoa farm owned by the 2013 national best farmer, Abraham Eduse, is alleged to have been giving out to a small-scale mining company called Arinase Limited at Chibi in the eastern region. The farm in 2014 was awarded um, the global best farm. And uh, very soon, uh, our reporters will be going there to try and get an update on the story because it is between, it's an issue that is currently ongoing between the farmers there and the uh, MCE and government of officials because the information we have gathered indicate that it is going to cost some farmers their cocoa trees. And uh, they think that it will be better to have cocoa trees than to mine um, gold on this land. It's still an unfolding story. We'll keep you posted on it. This is still Midday Live. We'll be back with more. Stay with us. In entertainment news this afternoon, some past GMB queens and participants have been sharing their expectations ahead of the start of the 2019 show. Osu Arai and uh, Chelsea Ifa Frema uh, interacted on uh, some of the expectations and spoke to some of the participants at uh, the event which was launched on Sunday. <laughs> The 2019 GMB was launched at Kumase, the citadel of culture, amidst rich display culture. 16 poised ladies will be seeking to make their regions proud as a show kickstart on Sunday, August 18. The historic launch was graced by dignitaries, royalty, as well as some past GMB queens. They encouraged their wannabe queens to strive harder and put their best foot forward if their dream of winning the competition is to be achieved. You should focus on where you are going and not who is at your back. They should just focus on what they are doing. They should give out their best and never forget that the only key to success is God Almighty. They should stay focused and they should make sure they concentrate on their task. The weekly tax is very important. I do know that those constitutes about 70% of the outcome of the competition, but I also encourage them to bring their best because the whole world is watching. They shouldn't give up, stay focused and keep their eyes on the crown, the cash, the car and the crown. <laughs> I'd like to advise my fellow contestants from my region to be hardworking, to be determined and then don't see themselves there. They also share the experiences whilst in the GMB reality house. My experience, I must say, was very, very challenging, yet fun. And most importantly, it was very, very educative. I learned a whole lot from nine other ladies. And it was so challenging because all these other contestants were beautiful and intelligent. I learned from them and I used those to help myself. And by God's grace, I emerged the winner. It's not easy to be in the house but it's worth it. Surviving in the house, it takes hard work, determination, and then you knowing what you're going for. GMB 2019, Black and Proud. So don't forget that hashtag, hashtag Black and Proud. In other entertainment news this afternoon, 55 cultural ambassadors across the globe are expected in the country for the Miss Heritage Global Pageant Ghana and the hosting rights at this year's, uh, for this year and has been declared the year of return. 
Contestants in this year's Miss Heritage Global Pageant have started arriving in the country ahead of the event. The international event brings together cultural ambassadors across the world to share their culture and experience. For us, Ghana was exciting because it's the one place where for sure you know that the culture has lived through modern developments. You can still see people eating the local food, you can still see people wearing the, their traditional clothing, the kente, you can still see people proud of their culture. They haven't let the Western world completely eradicate that. So we wanted people from around the world to come and experience that authentic African culture and see that it does fit into a modern narrative for the world and for Africa. Ghana, under the auspices of the Ghana Tourism Authority, a Ministry of Tourism, Culture and Creative Arts, is celebrating the year of return. In, in order to bring uh, beauty pageants from across the continent, we have they are coming from 50 countries around the world. And so they are currently in Ghana as part of the year of return activities being organized this year, you know. Contestants will be in for 10 days while touring landmarks in Cape Coast, the Ashanti Kingdom, and employing diverse activities in experiencing the Ghanaian culture through food, fashion, music, and arts. Yeah, I'm representing Moldova. It's my first time in Ghana, but I'm so excited. Uh, I'm starting to do Afrofeet a few months back, so I'm in love with your music. I'm in love with this culture. It's still exciting to try national food and dance with uh, local people in some local place. I think it's amazing. She says she wants to try Ghanaian food. All right, that's it for the bulletin. It came your way from our studio here at Adisawe in Accra. My name is Martin Esiedu. There is more news on our website. 3news.com. You have a good afternoon as always. Stay positive. Bye for now.